Okay, good evening. Greetings all. Welcome to another Room Online Forum. I'm David Martin, the president of the Upper Room Gathering, and today we're speaking with Mark Bauerlein about the digital age against humanitas. The title is correct. It's humanitas, translates from the Latin, uh, human nature, civilization, and kindness. Your presence is here, as, as always, is welcoming or welcomed, and it's a great blessing. So opening and closing with prayer today, we have another guest, Bob Laughlin, who is the chairman of the board of Upper Room Gathering. So please welcome Bob, and would you mind opening with prayer, Bob, please? Okay, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for all you're doing in a troubled world. We thank you for Mark Bowerlin, who is going to present to us today. We pray that you will enlighten all of us for what he says. Uh, we pray for our nation, which is going through some very troubled times, and we hope that uh, we get some insights into how we can address these things through the educational uh, systems of our country. So we commit this hour to you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bob. Great. This evening, as I said, our presenter is Mark Bowerlin. Mark is Emory University College of Arts and Science Professor Emeritus and Upper Room Board Member. He's a senior editor, contributor, and host of First Things Plot, First Thoughts Podcast and editor at the First Things Journal. Mark's books include Literary Criticism and Autopsy, The Pragmatic Mind, The Dumbest Generation, which we'll address today, and uh, how, I'm sorry, uh, Americans and, Je and Jeopardizes our future. His essays also appear in Partisan Review, Wilson Quarterly, New Criterion, along with commentaries and reviews in the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Boston Globe, and Weekly Standard. Um, quite a quite an accomplishment there, Mark. Thank you. So please and please welcome uh, Mark with me. Uh, Mark, I always enjoy talking with you. Um, Good. Often, often your interests and mine are. are similar, especially when it comes to classical pedagogy in schools. Um, this idea came to us from a, a First Thoughts podcast with Stanley Kurtz. And if anybody has seen that, it's great. You should go on to First Thoughts or First Things and look it up. It's really good. Um, and also, you had the article on the dumbest generation in the digital age. So I thought we'd kind of com combine that today. So uh, my first question was, how are you defining the digital age? Well, the digital age is just when, you know, in the 90s, when the PC became universal, you know, everyone was getting one. And it is, so it isn't, I, I mean, I know in a, in a broader sense, it goes back to, you know, the advent of, of computers and maybe the first message that was sent in 1969 from UCLA to Stanford uh the the letters l o g they were trying to spell login but stanford's computer crashed after the letter g so that's all they got but it was the first message that was sent over over the uh over the internet uh yeah, for what the internet was back then but really the digital age as a, as a cultural phenomenon is when the computers started appearing in homes in bedrooms, in classrooms, and then in the pockets of everyone. In the backpacks, uh, universal screen uh, became sort of just kind of like the air that we breathe, you know, by the aughts. This, this was the digital age. And one thing that it's easy to forget now because things have changed a lot relative to the internet is, you know, back in the year 2004, 2005, the internet was a hot thing. It was cool. This new Facebook thing, social media, it was taking off in those, in those aughts years. And then Twitter comes along a couple of years later and then texting and the culture industry 
and much of the enter education industry regarded this whole digital wave as a stunning breakthrough in knowledge, in language, in learning. And the hype was huge. And much of the hype was directed at these millennials, the youngsters who were adopting these tools before the elders were, they were doing creative experimental things online in ways that 50 year olds couldn't even imagine in 2005. And the predictions were in Wired Magazine and among various uh, digital cheerleaders that this generation would grow up to be the most worldly informed, culturally aware and sensitive generation and, and, and verbally talented generation in human history. And they were writing more words than young people did ever before. You know, by 2010, Nielsen charted them at averaging 3,339 text messages a month. Wow. Uh, yeah, just the texting, just the writing of text. That didn't include social media, it didn't include email or Twitter or, or all the other kinds of communications that they would do. And the prediction was that when these kids grow up, when they become 20 year olds and 30 year olds, we're gonna see American productivity uh, take a big leap forward. And we're gonna find all these wonderful social attitudes entering into the workplace, which are so much about tolerance and, and inclusion, diversity, all the usual uh, uh, hack terms that we hear now. And I'll stop there uh, before moving on to what has happened since then with the millennials, but we can, we can really move on if, if you have a, a follow-up question. On that, David. I did. I think you're kind of alluding to this idea of the so so for the people who haven't read your book, how has this fostered the idea of the dumbest generation? Seems like they're producing a lot of words, but are they coherent? Do they mean anything? Well, you know, I I, I wrote this book, The Dumbest Generation, published in 2008. And I did it for one reason, because partly because of all the hype. All of the glorious predictions of what replacing uh, a lot of old habits with screens would do. And watching libraries go from being book repositories to being information centers. Watching as I would get on a bus and no more kids would be reading a paperback book. And I mean, I don't mean a classic, I mean any kind of mass market paperback book, science fiction or, or sports biographies or whatever, uh, Twilight novels. And instead, everyone's got that phone in front of them. And I thought right off the bat, this is awful. This is terrible. I, you know, PBS does this uh, uh, front line or was it Nova? I can't remember. On Digital Nation, these amazing digital kids doing extraordinary creative things. And I thought, no, 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 this is not going to work out. They need to read books and they need to do slow, careful reading and they need to write by hand as well as I have my, my students. I still have my students do that uh, in cursive, preferably. So, I just compiled a lot of research on the loss of reading and the impact it was going to have on the intellectual development and really the social and, and uh, uh, emotional development of the young. And I thought this adds up to the dumbest generation. Uh, they, they're going to school in record numbers. They have high professional ambitions, but what we're going to find is that their knowledge is, you know, one, one inch deep. 
very wide, but it's one inch deep. Their verbal skills are going to suffer. And they're going to let the social side of the internet, that is the peer-to-peer -peer contact, peer pressure, youth culture, become a tidal wave in all of their lives. And the old forces of adult pressure, grown-up culture, would be delayed and perhaps never assimilated by, by the kids. And it didn't used to be this way. For instance, you remember the old cartoons, Bugs Bunny and Looney Tunes, that we watched on Saturday mornings when, when we were 10, eight years old. They had a ton of classical music in them. Right. They, they, they would play the greatest works by the greatest musical geniuses. Film scores, popular film scores, if you rewatch movies from the 40s and 50s and 60s, they would be produced for popular films. They'd be produced by figures such as Bernard Herrmann. These were very classically trained composers and musicians who would put sort of classical sounding music in pop culture. You remember the old Johnny Carson talk show. We're old enough for yeah. that. You remember that on almost every episode, he would spend the last 10 minutes with an author who has a new book. The last, the last few minutes on Brian Carson were about books and writers. When, uh, uh, when you watch popular shows like Star Trek, uh, which my brother and I watched, you know, when we were 13, you know, one summer, all the reruns and loved Star Trek, the old, the old TV show. You would have reference in, references in Star Trek to Paradise Lost, right. the, US, the U.S. Constitution, the Roman Empire, uh, the Greek gods. It's just little snippets of education high art, classical culture, civilization would be seeping into the pop culture of the kids and they would absorb some of it. But with the internet, actually I think it began with, with uh, uh, cable TV in the early 80s, which suddenly started producing all this youth stuff. Uh, adolescents could, could have, and movies from the 80s that were youth oriented, whose soundtracks would be rock and roll music, rock and roll songs, instead of, instead of classical music. But the internet put that process of youth culture all the time into warp drive, we, we, we could say. And that this would surround the young sensibility, it would envelop them in where aisle, adolescent creations and words and that we would see the result of this in in a few years time as they got older and i'll give you one example do you remember that song from the 80s valley girl some of you may not it was a pop song done by frank zappa's daughter it was frank zappa his daughter sang it and it was a 14-year-old girl talking valley talk. Oh, like, oh my God, that, that kind of thing. Like this. And I was like, and it was like, and we all laughed at that as precisely juvenile girl talk from the valley. How many, when you listen to Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, she says like, like, like all the time. Grown-ups, 40-year-olds, oh my God, they say this. You're talking like a 13-year-old. What is wrong with you? Where, did you? where did you not get any feel for eloquence? Or just talking like a grown-up? No, this is one thing the internet did. It solidified youth, adolescent habits well into adulthood.
so that you do have 35 year olds talking like Valley Girls from the 80s. And this, I mean, Frank Zappa did that song because he was making fun of it. He heard his daughter and her friends talking. And he said, I've got to make a song out of this. This, this is just wild. And now that kind of speech passes. The internet was a big part of that in, in 2006 and forward. Now, so I wrote that book, Making These Arguments, and got a lot of, uh, a lot of pushback, a lot of arguments in response by people who just didn't like you sounding like an old reactionary curmudgeon. Mm -hmm. And they defended the kids as well. I don't like you criticizing the young for their choices. And I said, well, that makes you a bad parent. That makes you a bad elder, for one thing. You're supposed to criticize adolescents. That helps them grow up. That's one of the ways in which they learn to be better. Uh, the, those PBS frontline producers, they called me, in fact, and they said, you know, we did this show on Digital Nation, on these kids and the amazing things. Then we read your book and it was like a tall glass of ice water. So we wanna do a follow-up episode of this on some dangers, or at least the debate on is it good or bad. So they, 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 they showed some, some self-criticism there, good for them. But we did that episode, but there were a few of us who came along and said, no, this is not a good thing. And it is going to harm the maturation of the young. Now, in the last 10 years, I think, uh, I think we were right. And I think we persuaded much of the country that we were right, unfortunately. But if you look at Facebook now, Facebook does not have the cachet today that it had back then. It's not hot, it's not cool. And these founders and originators in Silicon Valley, Mark Zuckerberg and, and, and Jack Dorsey and these others, they're, they're kind of creepy. They don't, they don't have that, uh, that aura around them anymore that they used to have. And I think that's one reason is because people know how much the internet is just a cesspool. And what kids do on the internet is not for intellectual growth. It's for social gamesmanship and, and, and porn and, and gossip and pitch, taking pictures back and forth and being cruel and all those other things that adolescents naturally do. And this was a tool that was enable them to do it. And they would read fewer books. They would watch fewer intelligent movies and TV shows. They could check out from adult conversation at any time, go to their room, get online. They could be on that phone constantly, wherever they are. They could walk around with 250 pictures of themselves in their pockets. We could never do this. Thank goodness I was never able to do that. This is a horrible thing to let kids be able to do. But it's there. And, and where are the millennials now? Uh, they, they don't read any more than they used to. They haven't grown up and started reading. Their reading rates, they average reading about six minutes a day now. They're 33 years old. They have about four and a half hours of leisure time per day. And they, they spend about six minutes of that reading. And this is self-reported. They don't know any more history than they did when they graduated, which was very little. They don't know much about civics or politics. Uh, if they watch the news, they just get that, that ridiculous version of, of current events that CNN and all the others uh, project. And they, they don't care about high art, certainly. And they're miserable. This is one thing. 33-year-olds in America today 
rate pretty highly on the misery index. They have low trust. They don't trust people. They don't trust institutions. They think they've gotten a raw deal in life. And they don't really know what to do about it, so they often end up uh, joining Antifa or joining in the marches for Black Lives Matter or racial justice or social justice. They're looking for some kind of meaning, some depth beyond youth culture. They're looking in the wrong places though because they weren't given the equipment when they were young. They didn't read a lot of novels. They didn't look at a lot of great art. They didn't listen to a lot of great music. They didn't get exposed to some of the great thinkers. These are the materials that would have given them the equipment to handle the tribulations of adulthood. I mean, much of this is just the difficulties of life. But when you're 17 years old and you can always go in your room and you can listen to the music that you want to listen to and watch the TV shows anytime and you can make contact with your friends and you can send pictures of yourself and you can gossip back and forth all night long. You, you think that, you know, the, the world is kind of my oyster. I can get anything I want. I can talk to anyone I want. Uh, I can look at anything I want. Life is pretty good. And then they leave that room. And they're 27, 28 years old now. And what's happening? Well, I've got kind of a, an uncertain career prospect. I, I work at a crummy job that is beneath my education. I work at Starbucks and I've got a college degree. Or I do contract work for businesses with no benefits. I've got student loan payments. I don't even think about marriage and kids. I don't want to get married. I don't want to have kids. Uh, it ties you down. I live with my friends. You know, four of us pile into an apartment in some cool place like Williamsburg, you know, in New York City or Austin or Boulder, Madison. I'm extending my social life for as long as I can. And I'm unhappy. I don't go to church. I'm, I'm kind of spiritual, but I don't have religion. I don't have any regular observance. I don't ritualize my spirituality because I don't trust institutions. I don't like my country very much. I mean, I've been taught when I was young that my, my country is a racist place, but really doesn't have any heroes to it. It's an imperialist venture from the beginning. So what, what do I believe in now that I'm 30 years old? What do I believe in? And they don't know. They're not sure. That's what we did. We gave millennials this delusional childhood and adolescence. Now they're adults and they're, 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 they're miserable because of this. Wow. Well, one of the things that we're, we're, we would like to see is kind of a, a real, what I'd like to see is a revival in the classroom uh, where we return to some of the, the classics, if you will. And one of the things I think, you know, when you do your first, first things podcast, you uh, have Wyoming Catholic uh, as one of your sponsors. And you say that they, they don't allow screens in the classroom. And you say, I love that. So what, what do you think would kind of offer a repair for or revival to where we want to be? Kind of is, is Wyoming Catholic on the right track? Maybe Liberty University? Are there other things that, what, did, what would the classroom look like? And how would it be different in well, the future? You've got to talk about the meaningful things. Like the meaning of life. What is the meaning of life? Now, most uh, at the college level, most humanities teachers, 
they don't think in those terms. They don't talk in those terms. They're either so professionalized that they're thinking more about what their colleagues think than what their students think, or they don't care about the intellectual and emotional and spiritual lives of their students. They just want to get away, do their own thing. But what, this, what the young person wants is, is, is to find meaning in life. That is where we need to focus our appeal, first of all. And that means you talk about big things, eternal things. You tell students, what, you're spiritual? That doesn't mean anything. You need to be religious. You need to go to church. You need to do something on a regular basis. You need to make faith a routine here. It's not easy. You need to put some energy into it. You need to read and talk about these things with other people who are similarly religiously inclined. We need to tell them this. We need to tell the, 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 the students, you know, if you, if, if you go and if, if you go, I've got to, I've got to walk here, get, get my, um, my charger cord. But if you're 22 years old and you're not thinking somehow of permanence in terms of marriage, family, and children, you may find We may have lost Mark there. He's run out of battery. Let me, while Mark is fixing that, let me check out the Q&A here and see what we've got. I plan to get to these at the end here. And old age. Oh, there we go. That, that's what we shouldn't hesitate to talk to them about. And then what we do is we, then we present them with materials that help them to reflect on those questions. So we, we don't, uh, we don't go for pop culture. We make them read uh, the books in the Bible and the classics of, of civilization. We make them look at great art and listen to great music and draw them out of the adolescent realm that they're all stuck in. We need to tell them things such as, you know, you're freshman, you're 18 years old, 19 years old, and you think your tastes are just fine right now. But if your tastes in music, in movies, TV shows, if your tastes when you graduate from here three and a half years from now, are the same as they are now, you have failed. You have failed. Something that should have happened in your life did not happen. And you must understand that adolescence is something to outgrow. It is not something to maintain. So this, I think, is, is where we have to begin. The direct firm mentor approach. Excellent. Um, it seems to me when we define humanitas at the very top, this idea of civility and um, interaction that you're talking about between students, faculty, and, and the broader culture, that we would benefit from fewer screens. Reading things like Herodotus or Libby or you know, any number of other texts You've, you've built your career around crit critique of, of literature and the culture. 
do you find it particularly, or what can you say about these current ad hominem or attack of individuals that's going on in public discourse? And how, how would this, this type of education that we have, how would that change the culture? Well, one thing that is a sign of intellectual stultification is the knee-jerk response by the 22-year-old. That's racist. That's sexist. Is that that's the best you can do? I mean, something got got you know some some switch clicked in your head. Oh, I heard you said that's racist. It's such a simplistic conception of human interaction to respond that way. It's so reductive. It. It conceives of human motive in such linear, flat, blank ways. It won't allow that people are more complicated than, than this. Uh, and the best way, I think, to get them to understand this on this score is have them read a lot of novels. And they don't have to be great novels, but inculcate a novel reading habit. Why? Because novels are actually pretty good psychology. When you read a novel, you gotta get into the characters' heads. Right. You gotta figure out motive. And you learn, okay, what I thought of this character at the beginning, my first impression turns out to have been mistaken. This character is actually a lot different than I thought this character was. And it fits, right? It, it, it makes sense. And as you read a lot of novels, you can't help but get into the minds of the characters. It just happens. You can't understand the novel if you don't think about what is going on in this character's head. Over time, years of practice, that breeds a more circumspect approach to other people, especially strangers. I love that. You hear someone say something and the knee-jerk response doesn't happen so often if you read a lot of novels. Because you, you, knee-jerk responses don't work with good novels, right? It doesn't work. So you learn to think a little more patiently about why so-and-so said something. You aren't so quick to offer the sweeping judgment. You know that some people shouldn't be believed. Some people's words are actually quite different from what that person acts or unintentionally. That's one of the catastrophes of the decline of literary reading is all these millennials walking around living in this Manichaean sense of human beings got the good ones and the bad ones and novels would have taught them doesn't quite fit that way excellent um i read a book recently by robert Barron, and he was talking about debates on inner you know at family gatherings or on facebook and he said we should be intolerant of toleration um how would we or could we stand our ground or stick to our values is there is it just through reading books or is it well, one, having meaningful discussions with others? One of the things about reading literature, reading books, Dostoevsky, for instance, is you learn to realize that many of the people who are pushing most strongly the virtues of tolerance, inclusion, diversity, are awful human beings. They are willing to get someone fired from a job for telling a dumb joke 
in private life. They'll do that. Uh, they'll sign a boy. They'll sign a petition against one person. You know, two thousand people will sign a petition against one person. Just kind of piling on and ganging up. They're happy to make make everyone a bunch of tattletales. Surveillance society. Uh, literature teaches you these kind of people are dangerous. These are the last people you want to have any power. You know, the lesson of Robespierre tell you a lot about virtue. You know, he was the one who could never be corrupted. He was pure. Yeah, l'incorruptible, he was called. Well, look what he did. So be careful. That's what's the first thing you realize. Don't be taken in by people who are so fixed on making everyone else virtuous. They deserve a lot of skepticism. So that's one of the good lessons of good literature. In the university or maybe even high school, what do you think a revived Christian humanism would look like? Uh, I, I think it would be just a very old fashioned thing. We are going to read the Christian humanist books. We're going to talk about them. And then you're going to write about them. And that's it. Simple. Good enough. Read the books. Talk about them. Think about them. And make students write about them. That, David, that's it. This is, let's not talk about innovation. Let's not talk about reinventing the classroom. No, no, no. Let's talk about reviving some of the old ways. For instance, let's have more memorization in the classroom, more recitation in the classroom. Let's have more writer, old writers held up as prose models. You know, one thing, well, you know, I'd have a student in a composition class who couldn't write. It happened a lot. And I would say, you know, we don't have enough time in this class to get you as far as you need to go. We don't have that time. I, I can help you a lot, but good writing takes, takes longer than, than one course. So here's what I want you to do over the summer. I want you to get a copy of Henry David Thoreau and each day, I want you to spend 15 minutes transcribing passages out of Walden, just copying them out. I don't want your words. You're copying Thoreau's words. Simply copy long passages. The idea being that after a while, Thoreau's diction his cadences, his syntax, his, his punctuation will start getting into your head. Right. You'll, you'll be absorbing one of the great prose masters of American literature. I so, totally. So David, what a, what a ridiculously old fashioned task that is. And I, I approve of it heartily. Learn to write well by reading well. I've invited oh. Mary Poplin on and because I think, Mary, you have, have a few questions that maybe you could uh, further the discussion. Uh, I have, I have, hi, Mark. I've, I do have some questions. Good to see you. Thank you for doing this. Yep. Uh, Mark, I have tons, and this is a kind of practical question. I have tons of people who come to me and say, do I send my kid to college? What am I going to do? You know, I hear what's going on. Um, I know you must get the same sort of questions, right? Oh, so, yeah. So what do you tell them? Well, you know, I, I actually tell them that if you're not going to go to a small liberal arts college that has a decidedly traditionalist bent, go to a big school. A big school because at the big school, 
if you're you're breaking up a little bit for some reason you can find some good student group uh, am, am i coming david am i coming through now you are yeah now you are but you were in the second okay you said go to a big school that's the last thing i heard okay, okay. uh if you can't go to a small liberal arts college with a traditionalist orientation, don't go to another small college that doesn't. Don't even go to a medium-sized school that doesn't. Go to a big school because there you'll have a large enough faculty to find some professors who do have some traditional focus and there'll be some student groups there that are amenable. You know, Christian student groups, some conservative student groups, reading groups, and that you find your place with them. And you be vigilant, right? You gotta be vigilant. Avoid the woke professors. Avoid the anti-Christian, anti-religious, secularist professors. Uh, and you can if you're in a big enough school. So that's what I would say. But finally, don't run up a lot of student debt. It's not worth it. Don't do it. You are ruin your life. Don't do it. Yeah. I've always admired the uh, what they do in Israel, where you have to work for two years before you go to college. You know, that could be a good thing. Kind of, kind of matures people, it seems like. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now I have a question from like at the professor side. Um, you used to be the kind of humanities oriented editor of the Chronicle of Higher Education. The Chronicle of Higher Education, for those of you who don't know, is a, is a newspaper that comes out every week um, for people in the academy. And right now, you know, the Chronicle of Higher Education is on the pretty far left end, right? I mean, now, they, they, I was, I was one of their main bloggers. Okay. Early on when they started blogging way back in, you know, 2006, 2007. Okay. And the chronic editors were actually very open to having some conservative voices in there. But I would say by 2011, 12, 13, they were starting to phase conservatives out. They didn't want to hear genuine conservatives anymore. And, and so they, I think, you know, what has happened is a lot of editorial offices have changed because you got some young millennials in there who are woke and they kind of scare the older liberal editors, the liberals who were sort of open to some conservatives. They're, they're scared of the young mm -hmm. and they don't want to be, cast as reactionaries themselves. So you find them I mean, in the New York Times editorial offices that, uh, you know, the young woke have uh, changed the way the Times works in, in that editorial office. So uh, the Chronicle, I, I don't read it anymore. Right. right. Yeah. Not surprising. <laughs> no. um, what do you predict for colleges? I mean, we, we already know that next year is down, what, about 20% in terms of yeah. the uh, people who want to go to college or who, who have applied. Do you have a prediction about that? I don't know. I mean, one thing, the, the, the top schools are super, super rich. Mm -hmm. And they've gotten richer because... They have big endowments and the stock market has done very well in the last few years. So they're not affected. You know, Williams College and Harvard and all the rest, they're fine. Emory, they're, they, they are fabulously wealthy institutions. And uh, many of the big universities are research universities getting massive federal funding because they are the research centers for scientific and medical research in America today. So they're secure. Uh, what I worry about is, you know, the, those smaller liberal arts colleges who really need strong student tuition to survive. They don't have federal money coming in. 
They don't have big endowments. And this generation is smaller than the millennials. Generation Z is smaller. So you, you, you get, you're, you're going to get a population downturn anyway. And that's going to be very hard for them to survive because a lot of those are very close to the edge. And one of the things that you, you see some schools doing, they're closing departments. Often humanities departments are closing because they're expensive and they don't. And, and a lot of students are not are moving out of the humanities into other fields. And so it just doesn't look cost effective to maintain these humanities departments in, in universities. So you're going to see, I think, a lot of that kind of cost cutting at smaller schools. I don't know if that's going to enable them to, to survive or not. I think more and more people are realizing this student loan gig is just a disaster. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to be paying top money through those student loans uh, anymore. And they're going to lose some of the international students as well. Um, I've got a few questions here on the Q&A. If anybody... We're opening that period up now. So if uh, Mary stepped away, it looks like. Uh, Walter Cronkite exit music used to be Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. I, I remember that. That's. I also remember that it seems like back in the day, it seemed like the kids were the ones with the problems and the parents solved them. Now it seems like the parents have the problems. Or, I'm sorry, it's the other way around. The, parent, the kids had the problems, the parents solved them. And now the parents have the problems and the kids solve it. You know, it's reverse. No. Um, you know, you would get, well, Johnny Carson, if he was gone on vacation for a week, he might be replaced by Beverly Sills, an opera singer. Right. You know, or put it this way. In 1950, there were about, I don't know, 160, 165 million Americans. Every weekend, Texaco would sponsor on Saturday afternoon, live at the Met, the Metropolitan Opera House. So opera, about 12 million people, 12 to 15, I think I said, so somewhere, would listen to the Saturday afternoon opera every week. 12, so about one in, one in 13 or 14 Americans listened to opera every week. That, that's how much high culture was disseminated in American life. Uh, the, the films, I mean, some of the classic work, art films of the mid 20th century were also Holly, popular Hollywood films, Orson Welles. Alfred Hitchcock, John Ford. These men were genuine visual artists right. and they were understood as popular. They were popular figures as well. So this, uh, I, I think I attribute a lot of this is to the rise of youth culture. TV is heavily youth culture and youth culture has no room for sophisticated art, won't have it. Of course, if it's not forced upon kids when they're people when they're young, few of them gain the habit when they're old. Right. If you're not brought into it, if you're not acculturated to it, you you're never going to know what you're missing. Right. I mean, I, I've I've had students argue with me. And, and, and say that uh, the lyrics to rap music are just as good as Shakespeare. And my response to them was, listen, you never want to say something like that in an educated company. I mean, that might fly with your friends or something. You may have caught some cultural relativism idea from one of your hip professors, but you know, most people understand how idiotic that statement isn't, you don't want to demean yourself with that 
kind of statement. That, that's, that's how I respond. I don't argue over something so stupid as that. Thank you. Uh, there's a, the next question is, uh, have you done any thinking or research on the effect of mask wearing on children's potential intellectual and social development? No, but this, this COVID lockdown and putting all the kids on screens for school is, is horrible. Right. It's a horrible thing to do. You're, you're putting kids on a screen all, all day long and it's the same tool that they use for video games and for Instagram and all kinds of nonsense. That, that the, the schools have got to open up. The kids have got to get out of the house and they've got to get back into rooms with teachers. Uh, it, it's, the, the, the damage has already been done. And we know that from the fact the federal government has suspended all testing for this year. They know how bad the test results are going to be if they do the test. So they're just gonna wait until next year before they try to do any more testing. Yeah, it's, I, I, again, I agree with you. Um, one of our participants, John Oliphant, he's asking, he's giving a reference here. Helen Andrews, a First Things contributor, published in 2021, her book entitled Boomers, the men and women who, women who promised freedom and delivered disaster. She writes at the end of her preface the following uh, about boomers. They inherited prosperity, social cohesion, and functioning institutions. They, passed, uh, they were passed on or they passed on debt, inequality, more bond churches, and a broken de democracy. Do you agree? And what, what, how would you maybe finish out that comment? Well, what I've said about the millennials uh, fits with one of the chapters in the Dumbest Generation book, which was the betrayal of the mentors. I mean, this is the mentors' fault, which is to say the boomers. It was my generation that refused to teach the kids who let them go on their screens all the time, who didn't tell them, read books, read books, look at great art. The boomers did this to the millennials. And so I agree, Helen doesn't talk about the boomers in relation to millennials, but I, I, I think that it fits perfectly with her thesis in that book about the irresponsibility of the boomers who just failed to maintain traditions, to pass along a world to the young that was meaningful and coherent and had historical depth to it. So yes, yes. I don't think it's too late. I think that, that there are some things that, so one of the things that's not on my list of questions, but just popped into my mind here that when you talk about reading books, there's one really good list from Mortimer Adler on how to read a book. I think it really is a, a, a really good piece of, of, of work where he talks about analyzing the theme, analyzing the motivation. Are there any other book lists or anthologies that maybe we could direct young people to, to, to get started down this track? Well, look, I, you know, the books that I read in, in college for my survey of English literature from Beowulf to W.H. Uh, Auden was the Norton Anthology of English Literature. Yeah. Just the Norton Anthology. There it is. The Norton Anthology of English Literature. Yeah, I agree. Go through, go through that. That has some great, great stuff in it. And it'll be a few thousand pages that you can you can fill a year by going through so that's that's one thing uh another thing um would would be the uh i mean you could you could just expand out on on that you could ask for what are the 10 great american novels that one could read 10 great american novels yeah. Ask your teachers to recommend summer reading Excellent. and Christmas reading. Uh, I'm interested in such and such. What should I read? Give, give me a bunch of books. And 
We don't tell kids to prepare for classes before the classes even begin often enough. Read in advance, read some contextual material. If you're taking a, a course in, in, I don't know, political theory, contemporary political theory, read, read, read Whitaker Chambers' memoir, Witness, you know, read, uh, read a biography of Karl Marx. You know, you don't have to read the stuff, read some contextual stuff that will make it more accessible when you do encounter it in, in the classroom, so. One of the fun things, you know, I've, this this year has been so crazy that I was working with my grandkids a lot. Uh, and over the Christmas vacation, we just took on as a family to read Twelfth Night and to look at the theme of how women are treated and, and how women, you know, manage their affairs and things like that. And my th my 14-year-old granddaughter and my 12-year-old grandson, boy, they really jumped in on that. They really appreciate getting something meeting to read. And I like what you said, that's, that's wonderful. Good, well, they can, you know, if you take it slow, kids can read a lot more than, in terms of difficulty, they can handle a lot more than sometimes people expect they can handle. Um, well, what are you working on these days? What are you reading and uh, what can we look forward to? Well, I, I actually have a book coming out on this issue of kind of the follow up on the dumbest generation. Um, where are they now? You know, how are they doing? And, you know, the, the, the dumbest generation kid who was, uh, you know, 12 years old in 2008 is now 25. How's he doing? How's it work out? How is that all screens all the time life worked out for him? Wow. Uh, so that, that, that's what, um, well, the, the first line is what have we done to them? Uh, and, and we as the boomers, the professors, the teachers, the journalists, the various supervisors of the young in, in 2005, uh, and them is, is the, the first fully digitized generation in human history. What do we do? How are we doing? And I would say that a great deal of the political social chaos today among the young is not because of politics. It's not because of Donald Trump or, 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 or police action. It's because of what they were doing for those years when they were 10, 11, 12, and 13 years old. Right. Yeah. Mary, did something come up, come to your mind? Uh, well, I just wondered, uh, Mark, if you had some uh, some recommendations. Let, let's say I'm a teacher of 12-year-olds, right? right. Uh, of something that would be uh, a recent uh, recent writing rec uh, that they might read. Is there anybody that you know that's uh, got things that are really worth reading? <laughs> Well, I could, I could go a few years before that, maybe eight, nine, ten-year-olds. The Magic Treehouse series is a great series of books. The Magic Treehouse series, because they're these little historical novels uh -huh. that Mary Pope Osborne has written. And she's got two kids, a brother and a sister, who can go back in time through this treehouse and they go to great moments in history and they experience things like the uh, Pompeii when the earth, when, when the uh, volcano erupts. Right. San Francisco in 1906 when the fire broke out. And, the, and they're very adventuresome. The, these kids have pluck and you, you get a lot of historical background from them, but you get good adventure and good, good writing. So the Magic Treehouse books for nine, 10, 11 year olds. Now, when you get to 12 and 13 year olds, look, I, I think that you should start reading to them out loud. A book called The Iliad and a book called The Odyssey. Absolutely. That's great. Because the, the kids, the kids can love some of those stories. And I, I think you have to read it to them. They're a little young to read it on their own. 
but uh, go slowly and have fun with it. Um, and I'll add one thing that, that um, parents and teachers should do more reading out loud to kids well beyond the time when, when kids know how to read on their own. Keep reading out loud to your kids until they're 13, 14 years old. You can read more sophisticated things out loud to them than they can read on their own. Mm -hmm. And also they're just the, you know, the emotional connection that's good for them through the book. It helps them love books if you keep reading to them past the, the, uh, the, their own ability to read. That's a wonderful idea. Excellent. Mary, I know you, <laughs> just, since you're here, I'll just borrow you for a second. Uh, in your research on effective schools, didn't one of the teachers or a couple of the teachers use that as a classroom management technique when kids were coming back from recess? They would read the book and the kids would get together because they wanted to hear the story. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, there are a number of teachers who read to the students. And I think that's, that's a really, it, it was a really good thing. First of all, they kind of calm down and listen and engage right. a little more. And there are, are a lot of students who really haven't been taught to read. And you're like a fifth grade teacher and nobody's taught them to read yet. And right. so, you know, it's tough. It's tough for um, teachers. But I think that's a great idea for them to read, read out loud more. Yeah. There's one other thing I wanted to ask you and see if you... Um, I see right now... Uh, well, first of all, this is kind of strange background uh, setup for this. <laughs> if I go in a restaurant or a hotel or, you know, need my car parked or something like that at a hotel, the people there are always telling me they don't have any staff anymore. And the reason they don't have any staff is that these young people are all sitting around taking unemployment and because it's better than having to work, right? Do you see that? I mean, where does I, it? I, I don't. I don't circulate enough to to notice those things, but it doesn't surprise me. I mean, we used to have a very firm Protestant work ethic in this right. country, and we don't anymore. That right. Protestant work ethic is gone. So, this is what you're going to get, and. Unfortunately, they don't have people in their lives that tell them, no, you, you, you shouldn't act this way. Right. You're not going to feel good about yourself if you keep doing this. You're not going to take any pride in anything you do. You're not going to be strong. You're not going to face difficulties with any spine if this is the kind of habit you're cultivating. So they're, they're lost. They're lost. I don't, I don't know what's going to save them. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> Unfortunately. I know. But I do see that. I mean, there's a, there is a kind of malaise that they're under, and part of it might, part of it is about the virus, and part of it is about poor education and not knowing how to read, not knowing how to kind of entertain yourself with high, high culture. Yeah, 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 yeah. The people that I've seen that have been really successful through this who are my age are forming reading groups and things like that. I think that would be something that would be really fun to see that happen. If I don't know how, how you make that happen, but I, I think it would be interesting if kids saw parents getting together, talking about literature and drawing these children in uh, to these circles. I think that, that would be a, a cool thing. So if you're out there, and you have, need something to do, have your friends over, read a book together, read out loud and have them bring their kids. I think that'd be a great thing to get started with, right? Especially if they're reading the Bible. Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> do, we have, do we have any other questions? Bob? Do you have a question? Well, how do we get, yeah, how do we get so-called biblical um, teaching and Christian teaching back in the back in our educational systems which have just been totally destroyed and thrown out uh you don't 
that they're not going to let any of that in. And and let, let's be clear that they are uh, enforcing the secular liberal leftist code more vigorously than ever before. Uh, it is it's coming down through various channels, including federal money. Uh, that that I, I think that religious people need to take their kids out of public schools i agree yeah yeah that, that's just that's just the simple answer take them out yeah good question bob did we lose bob no i think he's lost his picture <laughs> i'm it oh okay well great thank you mark i think we uh, if it doesn't look like we have and mary unless you've got another question it looks like the q a uh, section has been Exhausted. One, thing, one thing tell us something that you've seen recently that's a good sign even if it's like a, a project or something well I, I would say you know donald trump i think was a failure and a disappointment as president he do manage the executive branch effectively the swamp took him down and that was his fault. Uh, but what Donald Trump did do is turned on the light. And the media we now know are fake news. And they are openly, nakedly partisan. Uh, the, the Democratic Party is not about the old liberal ideas of, of uh, Bill Clinton even they are they are going hard left and the many of the institutions of american life including corporate america have shown they don't like a lot of americans they don't like the working class they don't like flyover country that i think that's a positive recognition that we've got more truth out there now than, than, we, than we did under Obama. And that that is certainly a first step. You can't address a problem unless you understand the problem. And you have to recognize who you're dealing with. And there are people who realize, you know, <laughs> Corporate America is not conservative. Corporate America doesn't like social and religious conservatives in particular. They're not on our side. So this, this is the kind of recognition that I think is, it's, it's a positive thing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, um, I think that draws us for a close today. I want to thank Mary for Mary Poplin for jumping in with a few questions. As always, it's good to see you. Mark, thank you so much. Very informative. I really appreciate our time together. And I want to thank you for leading or being part of the discussion. And uh, all of you that are out there, please feel free to send me any emails or questions you have at david.martin at upperroomgathering.com. I'll do the best to get you an answer back. Um, with that, I think we'll close in prayer. Uh, Bob, are you there? Looks like we lost Bob. I'm going to go ahead and I'll close in prayer. There he is. Oh, there he is. Thank you, Bob. Okay, Lord, thank you for what we've just heard from Mark and uh, for all the wisdom he has given to us. Uh, it's a treacherous world. It's a tough one. We have so many issues and so many problems, but you are still God. You are still a God who loves us. You are a God who uh, came to, to help and save us. So we need to be saved. Everyone needs to know the truth. And um, I believe the truth is in Jesus Christ. And, and, and he created and, and, and owns the world. But it's a mess. And we've made it a mess. But thank you for what Mark has helped us with. And uh, I hope that we all benefit and push forward and make things better. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen.
Well, great. Once again, Mark, thank you. We look forward to your book. Be sure to let us know so we can pass it along to everyone else. And then we will have another presentation sometime in May uh, and watch your emails for our next announcement. With that, we'll have wish everyone a good evening. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Mark.